So Dr. Rippy, welcome to my institute and please now enlighten us with your presentation and then I'm sure you have a very nice way of answering our questions. Thank you very much for agreeing to this talk. So welcome Dr. Rippu Daman Singh, Rippu, Rippu Singh. Thank you, Venkatesh. It's, uh, it's really nice to connect with old friends from school time, right? Uh, you bring back the memories of that building, of the corridor, of bumping into people, walking down to the coffee board, to the tea board. <laughs> you know, it, kind of, it's, it becomes a little bit nostalgic sometimes. So that is why uh, when we reconnected and you said, hey, Rippy, here is what I remember and I would like for you to come and share something with our students. I was just instantly compelled. I, mean, I didn't have to think twice to, to come and share with you what I have learned since, uh, since the times when we were together pursuing a degree. The topic that uh, I would like to share with you today is not scientific, is not very technical, is not engineering. It's a little bit emotional. It's more around why we do things the way we do things, why we should do something in the future, why we should pursue a degree, why we should pursue a certain career. So it's more about why rather than what or how. So I will, I will actually go a little bit slower. I know we talked about it. Um, we want to have some Q&A at the end. Actually, yes. I think I'm going to ask a lot of questions through the pitch and I'm going to leave you <laughs> afterwards to find answers for yourself. Okay. I may not have all the answers to the questions you will have um, and you may not have all the answers to the questions I have. That's why I call it a conversation. It's a discovery process. I hope to leave you with some thoughts. I hope to leave you with certain desire to discover yourself as to what you would like to accomplish in your life, in your career. And I'm addressing students here primarily. Um, Venkatesh, you've done, you've done very, very well. So, you know, going through academic degrees and collecting a piece of paper, which says you have been awarded a bachelor's of science or doctor of philosophy is one thing. The real learning happens in real life. And real learning happens when you start teaching. So uh, a lot of respect and regard for you for having accomplished what you have accomplished so far. Let's Thank see where we go with this. You're my inspiration, I told you. Well, let's let it be mutual. <laughs> Is there a way to mute all participants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can do that. Mute all participants. Can, I request to all the participants to mute themselves. Come on. Okay. <clears throat> Let's get going. So we all, you already talked about me and what I've done. So I will skip that piece. So in addition to the degrees and the education and the learning, it's the experience, it's the learning from school of life that brings you to a whole new level. So I'll tell you, when we do BS, Bachelor's of Science, BTEC, you go to IIT, IIC, wherever you may go, whichever university in the world you may go. I learned how to follow through solution steps. The book teaches you, here is a problem, here is how you solve it, whether it's a partial differential equation or a physics application of Newton's laws. It tells you how to apply the formulas in what sequence to apply the formulas. You learn how to follow a solution. When you do masters, you actually learn how to solve a problem that has not been solved in the book. So when you do PhD, you learn how to define a problem, how to explore something totally new. So those are, those are the big markers when you go accomplish a certain degree as you go from bachelor's to master's to PhD. 
Now, when I went to do my MBA, which is more recent, I think 2006, I learned how to make money. It was funny, it was all about how to exploit. It was all how to take advantage of the situation around you, how to take benefit of others. It was not so much fun for an engineer like me who's used to exploration. I kind of felt that I'm learning something which is you know, on the borderline of uh, commitment and ethics. Certain practices I could not follow even after learning them in school. But what I learned as an industry leader running various technology departments and now as an innovation coach is actually how to put the two together, how to explore and exploit together, but exploit in a good sense, exploit resources, not people, exploit opportunities where everybody wins. And I also went one level up this time how to define a problem which is worth solving, how to define a meaningful problem, not just define some problem that you can solve, but define a problem that deserves a solution. And now I am in the school of coronavirus and I'm learning from, from this. There is no school at the moment. There's no degree from this, but there is a very serious clash going on between an ecological system and the economic system that we need to understand, which means there's another opportunity to define problems worth solving. Over the years, the thing that I learned was how to learn. A lot of people, a lot of my mentees, managers, engineers, students ask me a question. What skill should we develop? And let me tell you, the most important skill to develop is a skill to develop new skills. If you can figure out how to learn new stuff every day from every interaction, from every event, from every episode in life, from every person you come across, you will continuously become a better individual. That's the whole idea. Learn to learn. Very commonly used phrases are, you should be goal oriented. What's your objective? People will ask you, what do you get out of it? What does success look like? These questions are all about what, 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 what? I think it's more important to know what's the purpose here? What is one thing? It's the why that will drive success. So see if you can think about how to go a level up from thinking what to do versus why you should do something. So objective versus purpose, we need to clarify that distinction, okay? Purpose is larger than objective. Multiple objectives, multiple goals are all coming together towards a purpose. By dictionary, an objective is a precise goal to accomplish a certain purpose. And purpose is a meaningful end result where you want to be. Objectives are usually narrow. You can have multiple objectives. They are generally near term and they're driven by facts. But purpose is usually broad and typically you have only one and it's long term out there. It's based on ideas. You generally cannot achieve it. Objectives you can achieve, but purpose is something you continuously pursue. Objective will define what, purpose will define why. You need both. And most of us have goals and objectives. We know what to do. Companies know what to do. But we don't always know why. Yeah, I want to become an engineer. That's what, but why? I did not know that when I went to engineering school, my parents said, hey, you have three choices, become an engineer, become a doctor, or you, know, you can have a Golgapa stall, right? And I did not want to have a stall selling Golgapa. So I went and did engineering. I did not know anything else, but I still didn't know why. I discovered my why about 15 years ago when I was in the middle of, uh, you know, when I came out of my MBA school, that's when I discovered why. And ever since life has been so much fun because now I'm in a pursuit of something meaningful. So those of you who are sitting at home have a piece of paper 
take 20 seconds, 30 seconds and write down if you know why you want to go to college. Think about it. It's not important that the statement is right or wrong. And I'm not gonna ask you what you wrote, but just take 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds to write down, why do you wanna to go to college? Rupi, you are muted. Ah, okay. Yes, I am. I'm giving people time to oh, okay, okay. write down the statement of purpose and. Fine, fine, fine. All right, I think, I think by now you would have scribbled at least a few keywords. Some of you wrote because I want to help this. Some of you wrote I want to make money. Some of you wrote because my father did this. You, know, you, you probably have different reasons why you believe you want to go to college and why you want to do engineering or medicine or business or whatever. It's okay. Hold on to this piece of paper. I will come back to the same statement at the end of my talk here. We will revisit this after I've shared with you some of my learnings, okay? So why go to college? Why did I go to college? Get some degrees, build a career. Why? Some of us do not know, some of us know. Some of us believe, well, for my life, what am I gonna do? I need to make some money. I want to earn some rupees. So I wanna to go to college so that I can be financially secure. That's a good reason, but not good enough. There is something more to why we go to college. We go to learn to learn, as I mentioned before. But let's think what's happening in the world today. We are all going through what is called the fourth industrial revolution. I will tell you, uh, many of students in high school are not familiar with this. In fact, a lot of companies and executives are not familiar with what the industrial revolution means. A revolution means it changes your lifestyle. It changes how you do things. It changes what drives the economy. The first industrial revolution was in 1784 when steam engine was invented. Suddenly there was power and people could do more than what they could do with animals and with horses and bullock carts. They figured out that steam can run factories, steam can run trains. It changed the lifestyle. The second revolution happened when electricity came and we started having factories and mass production and assembly lines, you know, and companies like Ford came up and started producing affordable automobiles and now people had cars, stuff like that. The third revolution, which happened in my lifetime, 1969, when computers came, everything started becoming digital. So that's the third revolution. I was born in second revolution and I saw the third revolution come around. The first computer that came to uh, Chandigarh where I was doing my BTEC came when I was doing my BTEC. So we had a chance to see a computer and we have seen the whole revolution as to how computers completely changed the lifestyle and the economic condition of so many countries. Today, we are going through a fourth industrial revolution, and that is about a connectivity between the computer and the physical world. You know, imagine when we talk about a driverless car, it's all computer that is seeing the physical reality and taking actions in the physical world. So there's a complete connection between digital world and the physical world and the digital world understands, the computer understands what's happening in reality and controls the reality. The robotics, the automation, the self-driving cars, the, uh, you know, the self-driving, the unmanned aerial vehicles, drone-based inspections, drones to deliver food and medicine, fully autonomous, controlled by GPS, go do the job for me. That's the fourth revolution. 
There is no specific date associated with it as of now, but for the first time this was accepted as a term was 2012 and 2013. And a lot of us are still trying to understand. So if you want to become an engineer, there's a huge opportunity here to pursue digital disciplines, to go towards artificial intelligence, augmented reality, 3D printing, all of those are the topics of the fourth industrial revolution. And you could be going to college to study that piece of technology. You could be studying any of these 17 things and then applying it to wherever you want. So maybe you want to pursue technology, not just make money, pursue technology, but along the line, it pays for your living. Uh, so when initially Industry 4.0 was announced, it was five technologies and now we have 17. And I think by the time you finish your engineering, it'll probably be 25 and then some will merge into others and these names will change. Who knows, it's changing so fast. We can't even keep up every year. I have to figure out a new list of things to do, but then that's what I do, right? That's, that's how, that's what I pursue. That's my purpose. Now, all of these technologies, why do we want these? They must do something useful for life, okay? They must improve our life. Whether we make a smart home where everything is connected with everything, or we have a smart city. I mean, in India, we are now talking about 100 smart cities. You could be talking about smart factory. The factory of the future is supposed to be fully automated. They call it lights out, which means no human being, everything is completely automated. Smart healthcare, the moment you are injured, the doctor knows it, the ambulance knows it, your past history, medical records come up, medicine data automatically going to pharmacy. Every medical device connected with every other medical device and with your smartphone and smartwatch, to keep you healthy. So all of these technologies which are happening today are here to improve the quality of life. So perhaps we could pursue a social purpose. We could say, yeah, I want to do engineering and I want to do electronics or mechanical or production and I want to improve the quality of life. I want to improve the way we live the way we travel, the way we take care of health, the way we grow food. I'm quite inspired by a startup in Chandigarh and Gujarat, which is trying to automate as much of farming as possible, simply to make a farmer's life easy. What a wonderful purpose to execute on, a social industrial purpose driven through technology. So all of this is good. And Japanese defined this as the fifth social revolution. They say industry is fine, factory automation is fine, but you need to look at it how humans have evolved. 30,000 years ago, humans were a hunter-gatherer society. With bow and arrow, you go kill an animal, you gather it, you collect it, you live in the caves. Then human beings learned how to grow food about 2000 years ago, farming. So that was the agricultural revolution. Then came the industrial revolution when steam engine was discovered. And then we had four industrial revolutions. But then fourth revolution when everything became digital also changed our life. And now the digital physical connection is going to make society far more smarter. Japanese call it super smart society. And their focus is a lot more on people who may not have full capability. You know, people who are blind, who are handicapped, people who have other medical difficulties, who have different challenges in their life. How can you use technology to help them? You know, how can a smartphone help a blind person just walk like a normal person on streets. So that's a part of a social purpose. You may choose to apply your learning 
for a good social cause. Now I want to take you to another piece of conversation. If you have a precious stone, when you have a diamond, how do you keep it? Most of you will keep it in some form of a, a locker or a closet or somewhere where it is secure, where you cannot afford to lose it. Right? Usko bacha ke rakhna hai. Har buri nazar se bacha ke rakhna hai. Right? But there is another stone which is very precious, which we must take care of. And that looks like this. I carry this with me. I have hundred of these when I give lectures in person, I carry these with me and I give it to my students and my audience. And I say, hold it in your hand and ask yourself a question. This is the most precious stone you have and there is only one of it and you got it from your parents and grandparents and you must give it to your children and your grandchildren. How will you preserve it? Think about it. It's, it's a billion dollar, trillion dollar question. How do you preserve the only stone you have the most precious stone that you inherited and you must pass it on. So your purpose could be more than just social. It could be sustainability. You know, this particular box that I purchased, this particular ball that I purchased, North Pole has no snow. There's no polar ice cap. It's all gone. It's all gone. We don't realize what it means. We don't realize how much climate change is impacting humanity. This planet has been around for 4.5 billion years. Humanity has been on this planet for less than 200,000 years, which is a tiny speck of its life. But in 50 years, in my lifetime, we have messed it up so badly that the planet is now crying. The planet is crying by giving us back what we have done to it. Coronavirus is not an incident, is not an accident. It is nature's way of locking up humans because we are not taking care of this planet. So your purpose could be all the way up to, I want to do something to preserve this planet. You know, whether you think of it or not, we are all trapped. And when you are trapped, what do you do? If you are locked up in a room for a long time, what will you do? Will you collect all the dirt and shit in that room? Or will you do something to keep it clean and nice so that you can live? I want you to think of it for a moment. We don't realize it, but we as humans, we are all trapped and we are trapped on this planet. We have no other place to go. There is no planet B. Yes, Elon Musk talks about planetary mission to Mars. It's not going to happen in your and my lifetime. And we may hit a point of no return before that. We must sustain this planet. We have no choice. Let me share with you what is happening to the planet and how it is happening. You all understand the concept of budget. I'm assuming you all get some pocket money, some monthly allowance, something. Okay, okay, beta, here are your 2000 rupees a month you must live with 2000 rupees a month or 5000 or whatever. The school where you go to has a certain budget. The country we live in has a certain budget. This planet also has a certain budget. The planet can only handle so much carbon dioxide. There's a finite amount of fish that can be produced in the oceans. 
there's a finite amount of food that can be grown on this planet. I call it biocapacity, not me. There's these guys over here who've been running this thing. They call it biocapacity. That's the capacity of the planet to support humanity. And we also have some ecological footprint. When we drive cars, we burn oxygen, we generate carbon dioxide. When we cut forests, when we kill fish, when we kill animals, we have a certain ecological footprint. We have a certain consumption. We have certain consumption of food and fish and every resource on the planet. And now I want you to think what happens if your consumption is more than what's available. What happens when you run out of budget? And that is what is called Earth Overshoot Day. It's that day in a year when humanity has run out of the planetary budget. Earth says, now you have used everything I had for you for this year. I will still support you because I have some reserve capacity for you. But remember, we are eating into our reserves. So this is how the Earth Overshoot Day has changed. In 1970, that's 50 years ago, 5050 years ago, just when I was still in my um, first grade, was the first time when humanity on this planet Earth ran out of budget on December 29th. And every year since then, it's been going in the wrong direction. There was a time when there was an economic recession. Whenever there's an economic recession, things get a little better, but they come down again. Every recession is good for the planet. And we keep going down and down and down. And last year, it was July 29th. And guess what happened this year? This year we have gained almost three weeks. We have gone from July 29th last year to August 22nd this year. You know why? Because of COVID. <laughs> COVID locked us up in the houses. We are not driving cars. We are not burning as much oxygen. We are not cutting trees. We are not doing everything. This is how the planet Earth is taking back the control that we, the most intelligent species on the planet, fail to do it. Like it or not, this is the number one benefit that is coming out of COVID in addition to the, the social benefits that we are getting out of it. Today, last year was 1.7. Today, we need 1.6 times the planet Earth to live. You know, somebody made a beautiful cartoon. You guys have seen those cartoons. They keep coming on WhatsApp. We wrap the world in plastic. World wrapped us back in plastic. <laughs> okay. When a child misbehaves in the house, we lock him up in the room. That's what nature is doing to us. We as humans are misbehaving. It has locked us up. It's called lockdown. You stay at home. Do not go to work. Do whatever you can do from home. Because when you go out, you spoil the planet. So this is an Earth Overshoot Day is not a new concept. It's been there for more than 50 years. Please go online, do some research and figure out what can you do to, to save it. So here is it by the country, okay? There's a good news here. India is not on this, which means in India, we Indians are doing very, very well. All the developed countries are here. United States, March 14, Canada, Denmark, Australia, Sweden, Singapore, Norway, New Zealand, Netherlands, Switzerland, Japan. Every developed country is screwing up the planet as if it's their eternal right and gift that they have received which needs to change. And that's what I've been doing for the last year, talking about these concepts and trying to wake people up. All my customers must follow sustainability. Otherwise I do not work with them. I do not coach a company or an individual who's not interested in discussing sustainability and how to save the planet from humanity. Wow. We still Great. need to move the dial from August 22nd back to December 31st, because if we keep doing what we have been doing, we will get to a point of no return and we will be extinct. By the way, nothing will happen to the planet. I'm not here to save the planet. 
It's been there four and a half billion years. Species come and go. We are just another species, and planet will have no problem eliminating this, making humans extinct if we keep behaving the way we are behaving. Okay, I'm here to save the humanity from humans. We need to think about how to do it. That's my purpose. So this move the date mission, they've given five major initiatives that can bring the dial back to December 31st. Now, Corona is helping them. Corona has already taken one month out of five months. So 20% of the objective has been accomplished. But there are things you do, renewable energy, population control, making good food choices, building sustainable cities, and of course, reforestation, conservation plants. There are five major activities you should be involved in. So guys, I have 200 students here listening to me at the moment. I want each one of you to read about this when you go back and whatever college you pursue, make sure whatever you learn, you learn to apply it for the benefit of society and for the benefit of humanity in general. Okay. We don't have to become- Great Elon message, Musk. Rupi. What's that? No, I said great message. Thank you. Uh, you know, Elon Musk is totally obsessed with saving the planet. One guy, all of us will not become Elon Musk. We, maybe we can just follow him. Maybe whoever is pursuing like that, we can go work for them, right? Do something which is the right thing to do for the planet. United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals. They are around, let's eradicate poverty. Let's completely remove hunger. Let everybody be healthy. Quality education for everyone. Treating boys and girls, men and women equally. Clean water, industrialization, climate control, saving the life in the ocean, saving the life on land. Life means all life form, animals, fish, everything, not just us. So United Nations has 17 of these development goals and every country, every company needs to pursue a little bit of those. We all have to contribute to that. My business is focused on number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And personally, I, I touch upon a few things here and there, but I don't think one person can make a difference. We are about seven and a half billion and we all have to kind of work together, including the government. So guys, when you grow up and you get into positions where you can make decisions, where you can influence decisions, look at the decisions that are worth taking, making the right choices. This is where India stands on United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Out of 193 countries, we are ranked 117. Okay. I'll tell you what, you can be number one in cricket and number one in hockey. It makes no difference. It makes no difference to the planet. It makes no difference to the humanity. There are things far more important to watch. There's a score far more important to watch than uh, uh, MS Dhoni's run rate or whatever. Right, so think about how we can influence UN's sustainable development goals. This rank is embarrassing rank. We did well on the Earth Overshoot Day, but we are not doing very, very well on sustainable development. Where is the virus? Where is the virus? Let me give you a beautiful example. It's again scientific over here, okay? The size of human body which is about five and a half feet on an average, relative to the size of planet Earth, is the same ratio as the size of coronavirus to a human body. Mm. A few pieces of coronavirus get into your lung, occupy a little bit of land on your lung, and quickly multiply and grow all over your lungs and kill you in two weeks, You've been living for 70 years, a tiny thing that you cannot see comes and occupies a land and grows up and explodes in the population of it on your lungs and kills you. Do you see the similarity between what we are doing as humans? We just occupy land and we consume it and we are killing it. And at pretty much at the same speed, if you take, if you look at the lifespan of humans and the lifespan of humanity, and you look at the lifespan of coronavirus, and the lifespan of humans and multiply it with the size ratio, the number makes 
exact number. Coronavirus is here to tell us what we as humans are doing to planet Earth. I want more, I want more, I want more. What are we doing? We're killing the planet, just like we are getting killed by virus. Same thing, no difference. How are we doing it? We are doing it because the whole thing that we call industrial revolution, that we believe is a good way to live. I have comfortable homes, I have comfortable car, I have air conditioning. I am so rich that I can waste food. I can throw things away. Let's get a new phone every three years. It's, it's okay. I can afford to trash it. Let me tell you, trash is one thing which we cannot afford now. It's the trash that's gonna kill us. A circular economy is where everything completely goes around the circle. Think about it. The reason why planet Earth has lived for four and a half billion years is because it recycles everything. Everything that's biologically here is recycled very fast. But we as humans, what do we do? We take resources, we take it to the factory, we manufacture products, we consume those products and we throw them in trash and we create waste. We are consuming resources continuously and we are creating waste continuously. Nature does not do that. We need to rethink, we engineers need to rethink how to reduce the resource consumption and how to reduce the waste. We have to get back into what nature does. This is what we are doing. We are filling lands with garbage. We are filling oceans with garbage. And now we are all excited about solar panels, thinking it's renewable energy. We are not thinking the garbage that we will create because when the solar panel lives its life after 20 years, what do you do with it? People go buy clothes because they can afford to buy. They don't realize Yes, you can afford to buy, but you cannot afford to waste. Buy only if you know you can recycle. Can you repurpose it? We produce 2 billion tons every year of solid waste. And we only recycle one sixth of it, one seventh of it. 80% of this we put in a landfill. So if you're trapped in a room and you start dumping your garbage within the room, at some point that garbage will kill you. So think about that. So I'm now gonna wrap up my, my talk here very quickly. Uh, I've already gone a few minutes over. Uh, so the innovation, the purpose that you choose, the career that you choose, if you're completely unaware, I'm sorry, you need help, go talk to somebody so that you're at least aware of why you wanna to go to college, what you wanna study. And if you're being driven by money, then you are just thinking of yourself. I call it greed. If you're thinking of technology, maybe you are passionate about it. That's very good. And you go to engineering school, great. If you're thinking of humans, maybe you're thinking of doing medicine. Now you're thinking of service. And I'm really hoping that some of you are thinking about humanity already. And I'm not, I'm not the first one to give you this message, but some of you are thinking about sustainability. Now, let's say you go to engineering. And then if you do something like what I did, learn business afterwards, and now you start chasing money, just remember you lost your purpose, or at least you came a level down. Go do business, but don't do it for the sake of money. Do it for a good reason, do it, for society, do it to apply technology that helps society. Do it so that you can provide service back to humans. Do things that help sustain the planet, that drive an ecological balance. Think about material life cycle, not just material. Don't think of just a smartphone. Think about the life cycle of smartphone. All the garbage and the smoke and carbon dioxide that was created when the cell phone was being built and what you will do with the cell phone when it becomes old, you toss it in the closet somewhere or down the garbage. Remember, this is what you're hurting. You're disturbing the balance. We as consumers, 
We create a demand. That is why factories, that is why those guys who run business for the sake of money will keep producing stuff. They'll give you advertisements. They will put it in your head as if this is the thing that you need. You need a new phone. You don't need a new phone. You just want a new phone. Think about that. Next time when you buy anything new, I want you to think, what will you do with the previous one that you had? And what will you do with this particular piece of material at end of its life? In your career, ask yourself a question. Where do you take sustainability? Is that a purpose? For some of you, it could be a purpose, but it doesn't have to be. It's okay to have a social purpose. It's okay to even have just technology or product design development as a purpose. In that case, think about sustainability as a constraint. Do it in a manner so that you say sustainable. So I basically went through some of these things. I want you to look at this, look at this list. It may or may not make sense to you. It's about you know, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, cybersecurity, smart living. But I usually run this exercise and I ask people, check mark which one touches your heart, which one can be your purpose. Are you here to just make money? Are you here to do technology? Are you here to serve people? Or will you also save the planet from people? And then I would say, can you now write down your statement of purpose? why you want to go to college and why you would not want to pursue a certain career. Now I'm going to give you, go back to that sheet, leave it here and I will let you have 30 seconds. Pick a few keywords here and write it down on a piece of paper in front of you. That should help you define the purpose for now. And it can change. It's okay after you get your BTEC, your purpose changes. After you get married, your purpose changes, that's okay. But find something today that should drive you to take the right decision, to make the right choice for the college, to make the right choice for what engineering, what medicine, what business, what subject you want to study and how you want to apply it when you grow up in your career. Another 15 seconds.
All right, very good. Hopefully you have discovered a few keywords. If not, um, I will talk to Venkatesh, maybe this particular list that I've thrown up, we can put it somewhere on a shared drive or on the website and you can continue to search for this in the next few days, months, years, whatever. <clears throat> um, we talked about, uh, Venkatesh mentioned about four books on innovation that I've published lately. The first one is about purpose. What I have shared with you in the last one hour is the summary of that volume one. They're all available on Kindle. If you guys want to read it and learn more, feel free. I, you know, and, and whatever, I don't make money on these books. All the money goes to saving the planet. It goes towards the ocean cleanup. So <clears throat> let me tell you, goals are important, but with a purpose. So when I was looking through your website today, I, I, I did research on your mission statement, vision statement. I quite like it, honestly. Um, find your goals with a purpose. You can learn technology from engineering school and you can learn money from business schools, but eventually the school of life and the school of living will teach you what that really means. Okay, so, so do it, have a purposeful career, build a purposeful career, choose which of these places you want to be. And it's okay over lifetime, it goes up and down. And also live a meaningful life, not just a successful one, but live a meaningful life. And let's all collectively take a pledge to stop squeezing this lemon because very soon this lemon will run out of juice and then we won't have much to go back to. With that, I would say, thank you very much for tolerating me. This is the message I want to share with you. And I hope that you will at least take some of it. And I hope some of you will be sleepless tonight thinking about this. And you have a different perspective tomorrow morning. Thank you. Wonderful, Rippy. It was an amazing uh, session. And uh, I think you've driven home some of the points more powerfully, which I wanted to drive. <laughs> So, uh, so what we'll do is we'll def definitely take up the questions now from students. There are many people who have messaged me. They want to ask questions, but uh, we have uh, my um, uh, mentor from IIT Bombay, Professor Rajkumar Pant. So he has attended this session and he has few comments. Uh, oh boy, sir, go ahead. Pantji, how are you? <laughs> he is from the same school as you. Oh my God, I'm seeing you after so long. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the last time well, I met you at IISC, when I had visited for something, uh, <clears throat> when you were a member of faculty, I visited. After that, I have not met you. So, um, see, uh, Venkatesh is organizing many, many lectures. Over the last uh, five months, I have been listening to probably, I have listened to probably eight or ten of the but I can say, Ripi, without any doubt, y'all has been the most thought-provoking, you know? Really, I mean, yes. the way yes. you have touched uh, how we are squeezing the lemon earth is most amazing. <clears throat> and uh, this is the kind of inspirational thing that is required for the young generation who are living more in a consumerist economy without realizing, <clears throat> without realizing, you know, they, they have become mega consumers. And, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, one generation ago, we still had something called second hand. We had second hand books, we had second hand items. And we took uh, no trouble or no, you know, disgrace in buying second hand. But it has completely gone now. And uh, the way you touched it and the way you brought it, I think you, uh, what you rightly said is that many people should have sleepless nights. That will be a good indication of how you, how much you have actually poked them. So it's wonderful to hear from you, and I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that I could connect with you again, and I'm surely going to give a deep thought to the list that you had mentioned. I am looking for a purpose in life because I have a few years remaining for my retirement, and I really am looking for a purpose. And uh, many of the items in your list are there in my agenda, but as you said, they go up and down <laughs> as life <laughs> purposes. 
So you need to figure out very soon on what I'm going to do after six years or seven years of uh, okay of my work. So I mean, mind-boggling, very nice, very very impressive. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So good to see you. you. Let's stay in touch. Yeah. Sure, sure. I'll try to get with you yeah. now. Okay. True. So, Rippy, this is getting very interesting. Lots of questions are still pouring in, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. And there is a problem in Goa that after 10.15, the connectivity becomes poor. So many people have already got disconnected. So I want to uh, request Samya Hede, before you dis get disconnected, to come and propose vote of thanks. And please tell us a beautiful poem which you have composed for Dr. Rippy. Please narrate that. Go ahead. Samya Hede, yes, I can see you. Can you hear me? I can hear Very you, well. yes. Good evening, one and all. I would like to uh, propose the vote of thanks uh, through, the, through a poem composed by me. When VPD sir showed us your bio data, all our minds were blown. This was the point when the seeds of excitement and curiosity about this lecture were sown. This one and a half hour was so amazing. May it be the presentation or the question and answer session Today, we students will take back home loads of knowledge and inspiration. Not just doing something for ourselves, but for the benefit of society. Money is secondary, but welfare of humanity is what we must take as priority. The question what is important, but the difference is made by the question why. Giving importance to the purpose first and then the objective is what we all will try. You made us realize all of us are busy securing luxurious diamonds and rubies that we own. But do we really care about the earth, which is in fact the most precious stone? During the pandemic, we all sulked. Many of us made a frown, but you highlighted what nature's idea was behind this lockdown. We will surely try to better the environment, keeping in mind this lecture may not be big steps, but small and fulfill our duties towards mother nature. You spoke about the industrial revolutions, in what ways they were bad, what ways they were nice. The lecture was so informative, to cover all points, my poem may not suffice. You are truly an inspiration to us and VPD sir's friend. All of us are a little sad for this wonderful lecture has come to an end. It was an amazing learning experience and unforgettable too. All of us enjoyed a lot and a big thanks to you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Dr. Ippi, your comments. Okay, fine. So uh, what I want to uh, suggest to Dr. Ippi is definitely a wonderful um, uh, lecture, but now we have to do our homework. We'll do that homework, get back to you for another wonderful session from you, and we'll have a lot to tell you in next six months or so. So with that note, thank you very much, my friend, Dr. Ippi. Thanks, Venkatesh. Bye. God bless. Thank Bye you, sir. everybody. Bye. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night. Thank you, sir.